All right, hi everyone. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to debate the Kant affirmative people will be reading. This is an affirmative position that will argue for Kantian deontology as their framework, so they will not be defending consequentialism. I'm not going to describe what the AF will say in particular. Uh, my assignment is just to teach you what you can read in response to it and some general strategy tips versus AFs like you. So the first thing is that here are some, here's a list of files for you to prepare. First is that you should have a file that would propose a counter framework to what they have proposed. This would be something like utilitarianism, which argues for preserving the greatest good for the greatest number, meaning that it's a question of the consequences. Um, this is what you're most likely to read, and it is what I would recommend that you read. The next would be a disad that you're comfortable reading, probably the terror disad or the budgets disad. Um, you can choose between whichever one of those you want, whichever one you think is strongest and you think you would best be able to defend. The third one would be the plea based ceilings or PBC counterplan, which you have debating with on this topic. It's the one that advocates for a reform of plea bargaining rather than a total abolition. And then the next one is a different file from ones you've previously seen. It's called Neg v. Kant, and it's in the Case Negs folder on the Dropbox in the Jan Feb folder. And this is a file that will contain a list of case terms that you're able to read versus the affirmative and will also give you some tips on how to defend the counterplan versus apps like these. So the first and most important thing versus any contact would be a counter framework. So this is something you have to read and should come first in every NC because you want to make sure you have a framework which you are comfortable with and which you are best suited to have offense under. Um, the util framework can be made up of cards like Gooden or McCluskey, which are cards that I think you guys have been reading for the entire topic or the entire year. And so there are cards I would argue that governments have to be using things like consequentialism or rejecting consequences is what results in things like racism, etc. And so you should make sure to have some of these in your file and be sure that you are prepared to debate with them and understand them. Um, I You can use the framework you were given with your negative case on this topic, and that should be fine as well. I'm not sure what specific cards are in that, but you should definitely use whatever you're most comfortable with. And then something else that's very important is to answer each of their justifications for their framework in the 1AC. So you want, or in the, in, in that are in their 1AC in your 1NC. So what I mean by that is you want to go down the flow and look at all of their arguments and be, make responses to all of them based on the framework justifications you have read and say why util would be able to resolve that or why that isn't a relevant consideration um, and shouldn't matter. Um, if you're confused on their framework justifications, don't be afraid to use your cross-ex strategically and try to understand what they're getting at. This is something that is really important and could really help you have a better grasp on what the debate is over and the positions they have justified. So that covers util framework. The next is the disads. So for this one, it's really simple. All you need is just some offense under your framework. So this would just be a reason why under utilitarianism, not abolishing plea bargaining is best. And second, but less importantly, would be a turns the case argument that you're able to make with a disad. This is a type of weighing argument as to why the disad occurring is a reason why that would answer the case. So for example, the terrorism disad, there are some cards in it that explain why it leads to more civil liberties violations, and you can explain why that's a greater violation of freedom or something. That kind of distorts the framework that they're going to be reading of it, but it's always strategic just to have little things that you might be able to fall back on or that the judge is able to look at after the round, which also makes your opponent's job a lot harder in answering each of these arguments. So that covers the disadvantage section. It's pretty simple. Next would be the plea-based ceilings counterplan, and this is strategic like it would be versus any affirmative in that it would resolve a great majority of their affirmative case and would give a better method of resolving it. Another good thing about it is that you're able to defend it conditionally, meaning that you don't have to defend it in the 2NR and you can just defend the status quo in your final speech if you feel like they've done a good job answering it. Um, the neg v. Kant file that I recommended you pull up contains overviews that you'd be able to read that would explain what the disad says. It's very important that you rewrite your own and just use them as a reference in creating your own 
because otherwise you could just read something you don't understand and that would defeat the purpose of debate and also could mean that you're more likely to lose the round if you don't understand what you're advocating for. So you should definitely look through those just to get an understanding of how the counterplan works versus the affirmative or how you should uh, craft and explain your arguments in round. Um, the next would be the case answers that you would read. So as I stated with on the util framework page, you should directly engage with their framework in your first speech. So you need to make sure you answer those arguments in the case. But then the next would be on their contention offense, a reason why you prefer their framework, uh, or a reason as to why abolishing plea bargaining upholds their framework. There are answers in the neg v cont file that would interact with that, saying why plea bargaining isn't structurally coercive like they say, or having plea bargaining enables more choice on behalf of individuals in the criminal justice system. And so there are those types of cards to read. And then the final thing that I'm going to talk about is what you should do in your last speech. So the must do, in my opinion, is going for the framework that you have proposed and the disadvantage. These two are necessary as a combo because without your framework, the disadvantage doesn't matter because it relies on consequentialism being a true thing in order for it to like win you the round. And the disadvantage will not matter insofar as you have not won consequentialism. So they are both reliant on each other. The next is a situational one. So like I said, you should defend the plea-based ceiling counterplan as something conditional that you're able to kick out of. Um, and so you should only really go for it if there isn't any answer or there's very poor coverage on it. Otherwise, I think that the judge will have a much clearer understanding of the util framework and the disad, and I feel like that's an easier way to win the round and it will be much less confusing to evaluate. Um, and the next is that you should spend some time on the case answers that you have read, but not a very not a very large time. So when I'm saying case answers here, I'm only referring to the arguments you read against their contention. You should always make sure that you keep answering each of their framework justifications into the next speech. But here, I mean, those cards that you have read indicting their contention is something that you shouldn't really spend a whole lot of time on and should only be a backup in case you are losing the framework debate, but it should not be a majority of your last speech by any means. And then the last is just a general note for debate in general. Collapsing is always something that's important and helpful, and doing it means that you're able to go a lot more in depth on arguments, and it means that the judge will also have a much clearer understanding because of the greater amount of time you have to explain things. So that's my lecture on debating the Kant affirmative. If you have any questions, feel free to slack me. I'm Sklink, so that's also my slack name. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about that if you're confused on the case answers on the contention or anything like that. Uh, thanks for listening. Good luck.